I want to thank all those who sang. Just beautiful. We are really, really privileged. Also, last night, I must admit, I love this time of year when the summer leaves and the fall changes. And last night, I sat out for a while in our backyard and just listened to the rain and saw the thunder. And it just, just love the change of seasons. And it's just such a blessing to enjoy that in this life. I want to welcome any guests here as well. Thank you for coming. And to begin this message, I would like to read an article in the September 1st through 7th Economist magazine. The Economist magazine is printed in Britain, and I enjoy the articles. They uh, tend to provide a very uh, non-US view of uh, events going on. And I'd like to share a, a, article, a particular article, and I'll share the title of it at the end of the quote. The article begins, London, says Tony Dennis, a 62-year-old security guard, is a city of sociable loners. Residents want to get to know each other but have few days, few days to do so. Tonight, however, is different. Mr. Dennis and a few dozen other locals are jousting at a monthly quiz put put on by the Cares family, a charity dedicated to curbing loneliness. The competitors are a deliberative mix of older residents and young professionals new to the area. Young people are increasingly feeling disconnected too, argues Alex Smith, the charity's 35-year-old founder. He hopes that nights like this will foster a sense of belonging. Doctors and policymakers in the rich world are worried about loneliness. Campaign to reduce it have been launched in Britain, Denmark, in Australia. In Japan, the government has surveyed kikimori, or people who shut themselves in their homes. Last year, Vivek Murthy, a former Surgeon General of the United States, called loneliness an epidemic, likening its impact to health, to obesity, or smoking 15 cigarettes per day. In January, Theresa May, the Prime Minister, appointed a minister for loneliness. The article continues. Researchers define loneliness as perceived social isolation, a feeling of not having the social contacts one would like. To find out how many people feel this way, The Economist and the Kaiser Family Foundation, an American non-for-profit group, focused on health, surveyed nationally representatives of people in three rich countries. The study found that 9% of adults in Japan, 22% in America, and 23% Britain always or often feel lonely or lack companionship or else feel left out or isolated. Later, the article notes, yet loneliness is not especially a phenomenon of the elderly. The polling found that no clear link exists between age and loneliness in America or Britain. And in Japan, younger people were in fact lonelier. Young adults and the old and the very old, over 85, let's say, tend to have the highest shares of lonely people of any adult age group. Whatever their age, some groups are more likely to be lonely. One is people with disabilities. The article noted that to combat this trend, policymakers are encouraging incentives to encourage old and young to mix. Cities such as Lyon in France, Deventer in the Netherlands, and Cleveland in Ohio, nursing homes or local authorities are offering students free or cheap rent in exchange for helping out with housework. The article unfortunately concludes with the following statement. Sadly, therefore, loneliness is set to remain a subject that causes a huge amount of angst without relief. Now, why would I bring this up in services? Why would I bring this article up in a group this size? Certainly, nobody here can be lonely. Really? I find it notable that the title of the article is Loneliness, 
alone in a crowd. For those who like titles to messages, I would like to include part of this article title since it serves as the basis of our discussion today. And it will also be the last four words of this message. Thus my title is Alone in a Crowd. Alone in a Crowd. Have we ever been lonely in a crowd? Have we ever felt that way? Have we ever felt that way amongst God's family? At services? At the feast? We see conversations going on around us, and yet we feel detached, separated, alone. I would like to bring up a personal story. I had the opportunity one summer in my late teens to help my br brother move from out of state back to Wisconsin where my family was living. I flew out to the place where my brother lived and on the Sabbath I went to services. My brother was not in the church so I went on my own. I called the minister of the congregation to get directions and for the time and what time to show up for services. I would estimate when I arrived, the congregation was between 100, 150, 200 people. I don't remember much of that service. I don't remember the sermonette. I don't remember the sermon. I do remember only one thing, how alone I felt. If memory serves me right, the only person that came to talk to me was the minister's wife because I had to call her to get directions. That's it. It was before internet, I couldn't look it up. Here I was amongst the family of God and I was alone, isolated. It's a sad commentary that the only thing I remember from that church service, the only thing I remember from that day, the only thing I remember was being alone. I don't think anybody in that congregation remembers me being alone those many years ago, but I do. Granted, I didn't look all that impressive. I had a lot of acne as a teenager. I came from a family that didn't have much, so I probably looked a little run down. But was that a valid reason to ignore me? to leave me alone in the crowd, alone amongst the family of God. Now you may be thinking, oh come on, it doesn't apply to this congregation. That doesn't apply to us. There's no way that it's possible that anybody here feels lonely. Okay, maybe some of us will concede. Maybe a visitor who comes, who walks through the door, we don't know who they are. They might feel lonely, especially if nobody comes up to them to talk to them. They might feel alone here, but certainly nobody who regularly attends could be lonely. Really? Are we certain? I guess I could call for a show of hands for those here that say they feel sometimes alone in a crowd, in this group, and I think we would be surprised by those who might admit that at times they feel lonely. And it may be that we just don't see it. But for someone to admit they're lonely, it'd be like a kid admitting that he's alone, sitting in a cafeteria by himself having lunch. Again, we may have some who feel the other way, that they want to be alone, that they're a Christian who can go it alone, as we, in the sermonette, the I mentality. That we don't really need others in this journey. Anyhow, the rationale is, they only hurt you anyways. They only let you down. And it's better to go solo than deal with the challenges of being with others. At times, being with others, frankly, can just plain hurt. 
To be alone or to go it alone, to be alone in the crowd, is this God's expectation for his family? What does the Bible say? To examine this question, let's take a look on the term fellowship and how it's discussed in the Bible. The first use of the word fellowship in the King James Bible is in Acts 2, verse 42, if we would turn there. Acts 2, verse 42. Acts 2, verse 42. And we'll begin in verse 40 of Acts 2, verse 42. And then the context here is the day of Pentecost, after Peter's message to the crowd. And in verse 40 it states, And with many words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and the day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued, verse 42, steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. When we think of the word fellowship, we would be naturally drawn to our current language for the understanding of the word. If we go to Merriam-Webster's Learner Dictionary, we can see three de definitions that fall within the topic of fellowship. The first is a friendly relationship amongst people. And it notes people came to the community dinner to share good food and good fellowship. Number two, the relation of people who share interests or feelings. And they note traditions that bind us together in fellowship. And third, a group of people who have similar interests. For example, a youth fellowship and a fellowship of writers. Now there's three key ideas that come out of these definitions. Fellowship in the modern language means to be part of a group. It's opposed to isolation, solitude, loneliness. In our present day concept of individualism, of independence. Of course it does not stop there because we could be in a crowd of people and even share th certain things in common but still not have fellowship. Fellowship number two means having or sharing with others certain things in common such as interests, goals, feelings, beliefs, activities, privileges, and responsibilities experiences and concerns. Finally, the third idea is fellowship involves having conversations together, doing things together as a group of people, being part of a group, a friendly relationship, having certain things in common, doing things together. That is how our current language defines fellowship. But we have to ask ourselves, is this the Bible definition of fellowship? Is this what the Bible means? Friendly conversations, groupthink. Is that how the Bible defines fellowship? When we look at the scripture we read in Acts, Luke tells us these early Christians continued steadfastly to fellowship. Other translations use the term devoted themselves to fellowship, continually devoting themselves. The Greek term used for steadfastly means to persevere, be constantly diligent, attend assid assiduously to all the exercises, adhere closely to, attend, wait on continually. The early Christians in Acts 2 just didn't have conversations. They just didn't have fellowship. They devoted themselves to it. That means fellowship was a priority. And one of the objectives for gathering together. They made fellowship a priority. How about us? Today, however, we often view fellowship as what we do to or before services. Our conversations with each other or maybe the time together in a fellowship hall or as we have a cafeteria, we have. It's a place where we have casual conversations, enjoy some coffee, light snacks, 
and if we're fortunate enough, a corn dog. <laughs> and this is not bad. This can contribute to fellowship, but it falls far short of fellowship according to the biblical standards and according to the meaning and use of the Greek words for fellowship. Fellowship is a very important part of our Christian journey, and it's something we individually should make a priority. How are we doing? In the distances we have to travel between each other, I realize it's not easy. But how many times do we forego fellowship on the Sabbath because, it, you know, it's just easier to watch a video. We had a long week. We could use a break from the routine. Now, I'm not saying we should come and fellowship when we're ill or if there's something that has come up that we need to attend to and cannot make it to services. And maybe there are times, even on the Sabbath, we need to stop, step back, and self-reflect. I'm not re referring to that. But what about those other times? In going back to Acts 2.42, the term fellowship is the Greek word koinonia, which comes from the root word koinos, which means common, mutual, and public. Koinonia is used 18 times in the New Testament. Words associated with koinonia include fellowship, community, intimacy, a gift jointly contributed. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines koinonia as follows. A, the Christian fellowship or body of believers, or number two, the intimate spiritual communion and participative sharing in a common religious commitment and spiritual community, the koinonia disciples with each other and with their Lord. Koinonia is not casual or passive in nature. It's not just saying hello or acknowledging one's existence, making small talk. It's more than coming to church and saying hi and leaving soon after the messages are completed. It's more than associating with just people of our own age group, our own clique. It's community. It's sharing. It's intimacy. In going back to Acts 2.42, we see one of the four things the church devoted itself to was fellowship. The others were doctrine or teaching, the breaking of bread, and prayer. Fellowship is a very important part of the reason for meeting together. It was one of their objectives. They felt it was that important. Unfortunately, our modern use of the term fellowship has become so diluted, the word doesn't mean the same as it did in New Testament times. It does not carry the meaning of koinonia. By devoting themselves to fellowship, koinonia meant the early New Testament Christians felt that fellowship was a priority and was one of the main objectives for gathering together. So today I would like to examine the meaning of fellowship, the meaning of koinonia in our place and its place in our Christian journey. Now when it comes to fellowship or koinonia, there are two key concepts in understanding the meaning as it's presented in the Bible. The first of the two concepts and understanding fellowship, as it's shown in the Bible, is partnership. Partnership. One of the terms related to koinonia is the Greek word koinonos. Koinonos means partner, companion, sharer. It has as its root the Greek word koinos, which means common, and is also the root word for koinonia, fellowship. Both koinonos can mean to share in a sense of a partnership, a partnership with Jesus Christ and a partnership with each other as a result of our relationship with Jesus Christ. We can see the use of koinonos in the next two scriptures. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians 8, verse 23. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 23. 2 Corinthians 8, 
verse 23. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 23, it states, If anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner, or koinonos, and fellow worker concerning you. Or if our brethren are quiet about, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. Turn to 2 Peter 1, verse 4. 2 Peter 1, verse 4. Second Peter 1, verse 4. It states in 2 Peter 1, verse 4, by which have been given to us an exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers or koinonos of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The International Standard Version uses participant. The Weymouth New Testament uses sharers for the word partakers. The New International Version uses participate the New Living Translation uses share for the word koinonos or partakers. The idea of participating together, sharing together, indicates a partnership. Hebrews 3, verse 12. Hebrews 3, verse 12. Hebrews 3, verse 12. It states, Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily why it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. The New English trans. Uh, Translation renders verse 14 as follows. For we have become partners with Christ. If in fact we hold our initial confidence firm until the end. In this instance the Greek word for partner is metakos. Which means fellow, partaker, partner. We're a partner. In this, we're a partnership. We all are, are together along with our elder brother, Jesus Christ. Just as all believers are united together in a community relationship, the Greek word koinonos, metachos, shows that we are all united together in a partnership with God and with each other. That is the nature of our fellowship. Do we think of it that way, that we're partners? together in this journey along with our elder brother Jesus Christ. The second concept in understanding fellowship is relationship. Relationship. In the New Testament what is shared in common is shared first of all because of a common relationship we all have together that is with God and through Jesus Christ. Koinonia was an important word to both John and to Paul, but it was never used merely in a secular sense. That is to just define an interaction between individuals. It always had a spiritual significance. The idea of a fellowship founded on just common interests, human nature, physical ties like family or church affiliation would have been considered totally foreign to those who espoused fellowship. In the New Testament, believers can have fellowship and share together because first, they have a relationship with Jesus Christ and they share him in common. In other words, it's the basis of our relationship with each other. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 9. First Corinthians 1 verse 9. It states, God is faithful.
by whom you were called into the fellowship, or koinonia, of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Next, please turn to 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. 1 John 1, verse 1. First John 1, verse 1. It states in First John 1, verse 1, that was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which is in the Father, which is manifested to us. In verse 3, that which we have seen and heard declare to you that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship, koinonia, is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship is first the sharing together of a common life with other believers through the relationship through God, through Jesus Christ. Fellowship is first and foremost, a relationship rather than an activity. Fellowship is a relationship rather than an activity. In Acts 2.42, the early church was not merely devoting itself to activities, but to a relationship, to a fellowship. It was the relationship that produced an act of sharing in many other ways. Fellowship means we belong to one another in a relationship because we share together the common life through our relationship through Jesus Christ. The idea of belonging to each other, having responsibility to each other, can be seen throughout the New Testament. Let's look at some examples, and some of these we're very familiar with. Galatians 6, verse 2. Galatians 6, verse 2. Galatians 6, verse 2. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And the Greek word for bear in this scripture means to carry and to take up. The Benson commentary makes the following statement regarding this verse. Sympathize with and assist each other in all your weaknesses, grievances, and trials. The apostle alludes to the custom of travelers who when too heavily laden with their baggage, relieve one another by bearing the burdens of the weak or the fatigued, and in that manner show their good disposition towards each other, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Even that law of love, which he particularly and especially enjoins, terming its new commandment, and making it the distinguishing mark of his disciples. One of the biggest challenges of this scripture is not the principle of sympathizing and assisting each other. In many ways, I believe we all want to help others in need. The challenges I've seen over time is the inability to keep such situations in confidence. As I see it, nothing destroys fellowship more than broken trust. It's devastating when you're sharing a struggle with someone, a challenge, with someone in confidence, only to find out it hits the gossip mill. It's devastating. Have any of us found ourselves the subject in the gossip mill? How did it feel? Proverbs 20, verse 19, the International Standard Version states, whoever spreads gossip betrays confidences, so don't get involved with someone who talks too much. There's another factor I would like us to consider about bearing one another's burdens, and let's be honest. It's much more easy for us to hear someone else share their burdens than for us to share our own. The scripture notes that we are to bear each other's burdens. 
For true fellowship to occur, the relationship just can't be one-sided. We may find ourselves being willing to listen to others, but we would never, ever consider sharing our own challenges and our own weaknesses. Well, we would look less than perfect. We would never want anyone to think that we're anything less than the ideal Christian. And we certainly can't let people think that we have weaknesses and challenges and sorrows. Well, that would make us look strangely human. It's sad, but one of the greatest gifts God gives us on this journey is each other and the gift of encouragement, of comfort, the gift of fellowship. And unfortunately, in all my years being in God's family, it's a gift that we fail to truly appreciate. Another scripture that defines our fellowship through our relationship is 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. First Thessalonians 5, verse 11. It states in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11, Therefore comfort each other, edify one another, just as you are doing. With the word, regard to the word edify, the Cambridge Bible for schools and colleges makes the following statement. The word edify, a favorite word of St. Paul's, points to the church as a house, a habitation of the Holy Spirit, each part contributing to the welfare of every other and furthering the life and the strength of the whole. The New Living Translation provides the following rendition to, this, to verse 11. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. Comfort, encouragement, building, edifying. This is the nature of Christian fellowship. Colossians 3, verse 16. Colossians 3, verse 16. Colossians 3, verse 16. It states in Colossians 3, verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell with you in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace your hearts to the Lord. Our fellowship should be at times a time of teaching. Yes, even at times of admonishing. The Greek word for this means to caution, to reprove gently, to warn. We are to look out for one another. We can't just see somebody and they're in trouble and we just throw up our hands and say, well, that's their decision. Free moral agency. It's true. It is their decision. They are a free moral agent. But in our relationship with one another, as a result of our relationship with Jesus Christ, we have a responsibility to look out for one another, to reprove gently, not to lecture, to warn, not to meddle, to caution, not to preach. Before we go forward admonishing someone, we probably should make sure that beam in our own eye is also removed. It tends to get in the way. And then we, when we do provide some caution, we do it in love. 1 Peter 4, verse 10. 1 Peter 4, verse 10. And I'd like to read from the English Standard Version, 1 Peter 4, verse 10. 1 Peter 4, verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one to the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by strength that God supplies, in order that everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines stewardship as the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. As we have received gifts, as we have received blessings, we use it to 
serve one another. Now, this doesn't only refer to financial blessings. To say we only can share if we've been financially blessed. We may have been blessed with a personality that's warm and open. It's easy to get to know others. We should share that. We should share it with those who are shy or find it hard to talk to others. Maybe we have the gift of listening. People find it easy to talk to us. Well, let's share that by listening to others. Too often we think gifts are financially based. We too often forget that the greatest gift we have to give is ourselves, our time, our attention, our heart. Whatever we gift we've been blessed with, we should make it a priority as good stewards, using it to serve others. In this portion of the message, we discussed how relationship and partnership help define Christian fellowship. Now, these terms may seem the same, but they are different in how they define fellowship. Relationship describes what we are a community of people bound together by a relationship with Jesus Christ, a relationship to e each other in all we do is Christ-centered. Partnerships shows how we are related to each other in that relationship. We are partners in which we work together for a common purpose through the fellowship of our brother, Jesus Christ. So why is fellowship important? Let's examine three ways. Three ways fellowship is important in our journey. First, fellowship is a means by which we can encourage one another. In life, we all have our ups and downs, success and challenges. It's the nature of life, isn't it? In our down times, we can be facing financial challenges, challenges with our health, challenges with others, at times, we may be faced with challenges in our personal lives that we just can't seem to overcome. We may be facing a cliff right now. During these times, we may find ourselves feeling down, frustrated, discouraged, angry, and if we're not careful, can lead to bitterness and disillusionment. And it's during these times, fellowship is vitally, vitally important. It's during these times that bearing one another's burdens is our duty. Comforting each other is our duty. Encouraging each other is our duty. It's our calling. Sometimes it may be just listening and not saying a thing. And these interactions can help us during those dark times. It can aid in our healing process. It can provide courage to move forward. We should meet together not just at Sabbath service, but whenever we have the opportunity to do so. We need each other. We need the encouragement of each other in these days. Hebrews 10, verse 24. Hebrews 10, verse 24. Hebrews 10, verse 24. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more so as you see the day approaching. God's word translation renders the scripture as follows. We should not stop gathering together with other believers as some of you are doing. We must Instead, we must continue to encourage each other even more so as we see the day of the Lord coming. The second reason why fellowship is important reminds us that we're not alone. Coming together in fellowship with others remind us we're not alone in this world. There are times when the challenges we are facing, the heartaches in our lives, but also the times when we have blessings and successes that we can share them with others. We are not alone. As Mr. Brown noted, we have God looking out for us, but we also have each other. 
That's why God made fellowship so important. He wants us to get together because he wants us to know that we are not alone. We can share in the joy of our blessings. We can share the heartache of our challenges, of our struggles. We can share the fears that sometimes that seem to overwhelm us. We can see that God does bless and that God works in lives of others. We can also see others that are struggling. Fellowship allows us to have lasting and meaningful relationships with others in our journey. Turn to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 18. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 18. First Corinthians 12, verse 18. But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothed with the greatest care. So carefully we protect those parts that should not be seen. While the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together so that extra honor and care are given to the parts that have less dignity. God has placed us in his body where he seems fit. It says in verse 21, we need each other. Fellowship helps us develop those relationships. The third reason for fellowship is important is that fellowship helps us to grow. Fellowship helps us to grow. Coming together is a great way for us to grow in the faith. We study our Bibles. We read our Bibles through the week. And prayer helps us get closer to God. And, and along the way, we have lessons we have learned, maybe in our own personal lives, where God has helped us and experiences we can share with each other, things we've learned along the way. When we come together in fellowship, we can share these things. Maybe we found something in the Bible we've never seen before, so we discuss it with others to gain their perspective, to gain something to it in addition, or maybe we need to be corrected in some of our thinking. Maybe we've experienced an event in our life where we know God's hand was there. God gives us a gift of learning, growing, and sharing when we come together for fellowship. We can look to God's word to show us that how God wants us to live and walk in his footsteps. We can share those steps, how each of us are going on our journey. It's hard to do that if we're consistently choosing to watch a video at home. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. First Corinthians 14, verse 26. I'd like to read from the Christian Standard Bible, if I may. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. What then, brothers and sisters... Whenever you come together, each one has a hymn, a teaching, a revelation, another tongue, or interpretation. Everything is to be done for building up. Everything we do in fellowship, everything we say in fellowship should be done to build up one another. How are we doing? Why is fellowship important? It provides encouragement. It reminds us that we're not alone. It also gives us an opportunity to grow, to learn from others, and to share our experiences. We need each other. When we speak of fellowship, we know there are those that are unable to attend with us at a distance. Maybe some in the video that's being piped out from services here today. Maybe it's due to distance or health issues. It's not their cho choice to watch a video, and I understand that. It's their situation. But do we know who they are? Have we reached out? Do we though have those who are alone in God's family? 
They need our fellowship too. Koinonia is not just limited to us as adults. Fellowship is not just an adult thing. Fellowship applies to all of us, no matter what our age. We fellowship with those in our later years. In their later years, we fellowship with our young adults. We fellowship with our teens. We fellowship with our small children. They are special in God's eyes. Are we a family? Embracing koinonia, are we embracing koinonia outside of our peer group, outside our clique? How often do our young adults sit down with someone who are later in their years and just to talk? Someone who's old and a curmudgeon, it's okay to talk to them. Do we really know each other? I guess that's the question. If we break up after this and go into our little groups, do we really get to know each other? Are we practicing true godly fellowship? Do we really know each other's dreams, hopes, concerns, and challenges as fellow members of God's family? Fellowship isn't necessarily easy. It's not easy breaking out of our cliques, or our peer groups to have a conversation with another. It's not easy to go up to a stranger and just start a conversation. It's not easy to devote ourselves to fellowship, to build relationships, and to build partnerships when we really don't have much more in common than the calling we have with Jesus Christ, our elder brother. It's not easy to devote time to each other. But whoever said God's way of life was easy? But the rewards, especially the rewards of meaningful fellowship, are so great as we go forward in our journey. As we conclude this message, we should ask ourselves, does a visitor feel koinonia when they come into our doors, when they come to our cafeteria after services? Do they see godly fellowship amongst ourselves? Do we feel a responsibility to reach out and to include them? Do we? Are those who regularly attend with us, are there those who regularly attend with us that feel alone? (laughs) No, there can't be, really? Yes. Are we sure? Are we sure that those, there might be some in our fellowship that don't feel alone? Are we absolutely sure? Have we asked? Rick Warren, founder and pastor of Saddleback Church, made the following observation regarding fellowship. We are created for community, fashioned for fellowship, formed for a family, and none of us can fulfill God's purpose, God's purposes by ourselves. In other words, we need each other. Living God's way of life is not a solo endeavor. It's about family. It's about fellowship. And for that reason, when God's family is gathered together, whether at services or any other time, for whatever, whatever reason, no one should ever feel alone in a crowd.